All right, guys. So I've been asked by uh, a lot of people at the club and uh, just in general that know me about all kinds of stuff. What's going on with the Supreme Court? What's going on with the Floyd card case? What's going on with this ghost gun bill? So rather than answer a bunch of questions a hundred times, I thought I would just uh, start doing some videos on my YouTube channel and talk about this. So a couple of things, uh, I was the NRA lobbyist for over 25 years in Illinois as a contractor. Uh, I got over 30 years lobbying uh, the Illinois General Assembly. I did do some lobbying of Congress occasionally, not for NRA, but for other people. Never really liked it. Uh, but a uh, couple of things, this is going to be Todd's two-way talk. So we used to have Todd's truck talk when I was driving into the club, getting ready to do a day's worth of dirt work and keep you guys up guys said the audio on that wasn't the best so uh, we're gonna do this uh this is me sitting at my desk in my office uh yes this is the disaster i work out of uh yes there's a bottle of jack daniels with me uh and yes i'm drinking jack and diet tonight so um if you happen to find that offensive then I suggest you quit finding me. Um, we're going to do this by big boys rules. And this is my channel, my way. So if you don't like it, go somewhere else. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of things <clears throat> that came out of the oral arguments in the New York State rifle and pistol case. Uh, this is the case where they're challenging the, you know, you have to have just cause or a specific reason why you should be given uh, what's considered an unrestricted carry permit. And there's a lot of things that I think were missed in a lot of the commentary. Um, these keyboard commandos who've never spent a day in the legislature, never edited a court brief, uh, never, you know, built up an argument to take the court. Um, I don't know, maybe they're just missing some of the stuff. But uh, I'm going to jump over here to, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, if you go to the transcripts on the oral arguments, <clears throat> bottom of page 93, the Chief Justice jumps in here, and there was a question, and there's, there's a lot of dealings about scrutiny and the level of review that should be adopted. Do we adopt the First Amendment style status uh, to how we evaluate gun laws? Uh, so you've got that kind of marquee. You've got the levels of scrutiny, strict scrutiny, which means there's gotta be an overwhelming, compelling governmental interest, and you can only regulate it in the most limited of fashions. You've got intermediate scrutiny, which there has to be a compelling government interest and they have to kind of find, you know, uh, uh, the least restrictive ways to kind of handle things. Then you have rational basis, which if the government says we want to do this, that's essentially good enough. Uh, and through all this stuff, through the appellate courts across the country, uh, they've been making all kinds of arguments. And so there were two big arguments that were done by opposing counsel and that were being fought by Paul Clement, uh, the NRA attorney, uh, who's on retainer uh, for this. And I've got a couple stories about him in our cases and things like that. But uh, with Paul Clement, uh, so one argument was, what were the laws in 1791? If you're using text, tradition, history to the Constitution, what were the laws at 1791 when it was adopted? That's one, that's one style. Another one is what were the laws around 1865 when the 14th Amendment was ratified? That's another style. Um, and that's what a whole lot of the argument was being done about here. And that took up the lion's share of the time. And they got into, you know, would guns in Central Park be okay? And there's a bunch of stuff on But the Chief Justice had this little colloquy here. And I think it's very, very telling. Um, 
my my thinking is Thomas is going to write the opinion. He's going to write the opinion. He's been the guy that's been at the forefront of this since Scalia died. They gave the Dobbs opinion, the abortion opinion to Alito. I think that if Alito had written it, we might get a stronger opinion, more uh, well-reasoned one. I have concerns about Thomas going off on the uh, P&I stuff, privileges and immunities. He did that in McDonald, and he was the only one to do that. Nobody else even went down that road. <clears throat> so here's the real thing that I have not heard anybody else talk about, nor give it any thought. And I think this is telling. And this is why I think we're going to win this case, because Roberts may have been trying to do some incrementalism with stuff, but with the, the five other conservative Republican justices on there, I think he knows he's in a box. But this is a point that I think the anti-gunners, if they actually understood what he said, they'd be peeing their pants. Because this thing... It, this is pretty incredible once we dive down into it. So, uh, bottom of page 93, Chief Justice Roberts. I mean, what is the appropriate analysis? I mean, you sort of, we, we I think, generally don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, the first thing I would look to in answering this question is not the statue of Northampton. That goes back to the 1791 stuff. It's Heller. And Heller has gone through all this stuff, and obviously in somewhat different context, although it's part of the debate, self-defense at the home. You know this is different. But I still think that you have to begin with Heller and its recognition that the Second Amendment, you know it, it has its own limitations. But it is to be the, interpreted the same way you'd interpret other provisions of the Constitution. And I wonder... What your best answer is to the point that Mr. Clement makes in his brief, which is that, for example, if you're asserting a claim to confront the witness against you under the Constitution, you don't have to say, I've got a special reason. This is why I think it's important uh, to my defense. The Constitution gives you that right. And if someone's going to take it away from you, they have to justify it. You don't have to say when you're looking for a permit to speak on the street corner or whatever, you know, your speech is particularly important. So why do you have to show in this case, convince somebody that you're entitled to exercise your Second Amendment right? That ends at the top of page 95. What's the real part here that grabs you? He doesn't. He mentions Northampton, and, I, and you know, that was my comment about 1791. He didn't even touch on the 14th Amendment of 1865. No, he went back to 2008 and Heller. That's what he did. He went to Heller. Okay, what does Heller say? And this is where the anti-gunners should be pissing their pants. Because if his thinking carries over, so what did Heller say? Heller held, the first holding, the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm unconnected with service in the militia and to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. The anti-gunners are big to forget that such as qualifying phrase. Self-defense within the home was an example not a limitation. So now, let's go to page 8 of Heller. And in the middle of the page, we have this. Some have made the argument, bordering on the frivolous, that only those arms in existence in the 18th century are protected by the Second Amendment. We do not interpret constitutional rights that way. Just as the First Amendment protects modern forms of communication, and the Fourth Amendment applies to modern forms of search, the Second Amendment extends prima facie to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. That means that all the AR bans, semi-auto bans, 
all that BS is gone. If Heller becomes the foundation, that right there says at least everything that's not in the NFA is protected under the Second Amendment, and they can't touch it. And that, that really should have them very, very nervous. Um, the other part <clears throat> that I think should, uh, this, th this part would throw uh, a ton of cold water on the Ninth Circuit and a couple of those other districts that have tried to weasel intermediate scrutiny down the rational basis and everything else um, that's out there. Uh, so at the bottom of page 62, <clears throat> and I'll let my throat before I have to read all this. The bottom of page 62, we know of no other enumerated constitutional right whose core protection has been subjected to a freestanding interest balancing approach. The very enumeration of that right takes out of the hands of government, even the third branch of government, the power to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether the right is really worth insisting upon. A constitutional guarantee subject to future judges' assessments of its usefulness is no constitutional guarantee at all. Constitutional rights are enshrined with the scope they were understood to have when the people adopted them, whether or not future judge, future legislatures, or yes, even future judges, think that scope too broad. We would not apply an interest balancing approach to the prohibition of a peaceful neo-Nazi march in Skokie. The First Amendment contains the freedom of speech guarantee that the people ratified, which included exceptions for obscenity, libel, and disclosure of state secrets, but not for the expression of extremely unpopular and wrong-headed views. The Second Amendment is no different. Like the First, it is the very product of an interest balancing by the people, which Justice Breyer would now conduct anew for them. And whatever else it leaves to the future elevation, it surely elevates above all other interests the right of law-abiding, responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home. <clears throat> if you add the three things, the first holding, the pro, you know, the, the argument that modern arms are protected, and now what is here on page 62 and 63 of the Heller decision, that there is no interest balancing for the court to do. That guts virtually everything the anti-gunners want. <clears throat> Their semi-auto bans, gone. I think red flag laws can be found constitutional, but only if there's an adversarial hearing up front that there has to be, the person has to be given notice, an opportunity to defend themselves with counsel and face their accuser uh, to remove a fundamental constitutional right. Uh, I think that waiting periods, gone. Uh, <clears throat> I think that FOID card, gone. You heard it in Justice Roberts' comments. Why do I ask to ask permission and give a reason to the government? Um, uh, I think that's all gone. Uh, I think I think registration is problematic. I don't think they get to keep on to that stuff. And I think magazine bans. I think they're gone as well. If this is the standard, if Justice Roberts thinking on this carries the day. I think the anti-gunners have a very, very big problem on their hands. And that's why they've been <clears throat> blowing their stack and, and making all kinds of claims about New York. And I've said for the longest time, the, the golden egg, the, the heart and soul of New York is not getting carry uh, across the country that all this May issue stuff goes out the window. And if we prevail on that, then there are parts of the Illinois law that certainly should come under attack legally and within the courts. 
and this whole cop's objection thing I think goes out the window but if we prevail under Robert's thinking that Heller is the standard <clears throat> and I hope that the Chief Justice makes a compelling argument in his memos and his analysis and in his fight to join the majority opinion. If he does that, if we get that, and the whole argument about Northampton in 1791, <clears throat> gone. 14th Amendment, in, say, eight, you know, 1865, gone. Uh, we are down to what Heller said. And there's a few other caveats within Heller um, that I think are noteworthy and, and interesting, but those those specific passages I, I think will put the anti-gunners into a death spiral. Uh, they will just be pulling their hair out like a triggered um, meme like you ain't never seen before if his thinking prevails. And I've not heard anybody else in the blogosphere or in YouTube land or anywhere else talk about this. Uh, I think it, it was a short passage. It was a couple of sentences, and it was glossed over. And everybody else went into analyzing some other things. And uh, I think there's... The antis have a right to be scared about the standard of review portions of this. Uh, we had always, up to this point, talked about if we got strict scrutiny for a whole bunch of stuff, uh, we'd be really, well, uh, I think this is better than strict scrutiny. Um, but I have more comments about some other stuff and some other videos. This is my first one of uh, Todd's 2A talk. So uh, Memorial Day weekend. Um, Here's raising a glass to those that wore the uniform and never made it home. We'll talk to you later with the next subject. See you guys.